I know. I understand. More major C's is probably not what you really want to be viewing anymore. You'll be sick of major C's. And this shorter sort of video is not really meant to make you an expert in what we're about to talk about. I just want to give you an idea when I talk about things like eigenvalues, eigenvectors, what are we talking about and why am I talking about it and why is it useful? So these things get used quite often, a lot more often than you might, you might expect. So at least want to give you an idea of what they are and how they work, even though I don't think this is, this is enough. This is not like a sufficient to make you an expert or to even really give you a complete idea of how to go through and do a complete eigenvalue deconstruction by hand or something. That's not what this is for. This is just to scratch the surface, give you a little bit, a little tiny idea of what's going on so you can understand when people talk about it in reference to factor analysis or even MANOVA or other places that it makes some sense, okay? It makes you feel a little bit more knowledgeable about it. So why are we talking about this? We talked about matrices before. We even talked about summarizing them, things like the trace and the determinant of a matrix or ways of summarizing. This is going a bit further. I'm actually trying to take large amounts of data, reconfigure and summarize them to make them easier to sort of package, easier to understand, but also as a way of trying to find, in this case, try to find patterns. So while a, you know, a determinant tells you what the generalized variance of the volume of matrix is, when what we're talking about here, we're summarizing and reconfiguring we're trying to figure out, is there other patterns that are emerging within a matrix? And can we identify those patterns? Patterns of data that are related to one another. Okay. So here we're talking about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Now, I, I may have mentioned this. Actually, I, I know I did in talking about the data screening process. So one of the ways in which we look for multicollinearity is to look at the eigenvalues that come out of, of that like data screening packages in SPSS and other places. You look at your condition index. And condition index is a ratio of the first to each consecutive uh, eigenvalue. Let's talk about why that is. What, what does it even matter? So the eigenvalue vector decomposition process takes a matrix, uh, could be huge, massive amounts of data, it tries to break it down into pieces based on patterns that it can that it can identify. Now it may seem like complicated, and mathematically it is you know complicated. But if you think about it just conceptually, it's just like it's trying to run a bunch of regressions. It's trying to simultaneously run regressions to find not just one pattern, because usually in regression we're trying to find a single pattern of how the variables relate to an outcome. Well, this is now just trying to find patterns of how data can be linked together and how they might relate to one another. And it's doing so multiple times, finding multiple different kinds of patterns all at the same time, all while trying to uh, reduce the, the sheer dimensions of a matrix that can be really large. Like it takes an N dimensional. So it can be, it could be a 100 by 100 matrix and it tries to reconfigure them into smaller chunks, smaller pieces of information that we can extract out of the matrix. But it seems useful. Because often as we're trying to find patterns, we're trying to do things. This is even stuff that goes on, on the, in the internet. When, you know, a place like Netflix or some places is trying to extract data and meaning out of massive amounts of data they collect from everyone's clicking and watching patterns or behaviors on Netflix, they can use something like an eigenvalue, eigenvector decomposition to try to identify patterns and, and how things go together with other things. So this, these kinds of things are used most applicably. You're going to see it discussed most in places like factor analysis. We'll talk about in canonical correlation. And even things like cluster analysis and other places where we're trying to identify patterns. Now, sometimes it's patterns where we want variables to relate. What are the patterns of variable relationships? And the flip side, which is what are the patterns of people? What kinds of people respond certain ways? That's cluster analysis. We're kind of, we're trying to, put together respondents, identify people that have similar responses across variables. Factor analysis is trying to find variables that have similar um, patterns across people. They're sort of the reverse. One is trying to, to, to cluster variables. The other one's trying to cluster people. We call one factor analysis, the other one cluster analysis, but they're 
the frameworks, the mathematics behind them are, are very similar. And they, they rely on this sort of eigenvalue, eigenvector decomposition to identify those patterns and put things together. Okay, so here we're going to we're gonna take a matrix, we're going to break it down into parts. We're going to find patterns and try to break it down into parts. It takes a number, it takes the values in n-dimensional space and reconfigures them into multiple one-dimension approximations. So what does that mean? Same way where we're talking about um, x-y relationship and we're trying to put a pattern through there, we're trying to find a you know, dimension. That's taking two dimensions, x and y, and trying to find a single dimension that cuts through both and can, can combine them. It's just that with the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, it's doing it multiple times. Sometimes you'll hear the term singular value decomposition or something like that, which is essentially the same process. Eigenvalue, eigenvector, singular value decomposition, they're the same process with just a minor difference. But the similar mathematical process, they're widely used to find patterns in large data, like I talked about before, Google searches, like you don't know when you do a Google search and it's going through just tons and tons and tons and tons of data, it's using these kinds of shortcuts, these these uh, mathematical shortcuts to try to find typical patterns to give you back search criteria that matches what you're looking for. Instead of doing, you imagine how long it would take if it actually checked every single website out there for information, it's actually creating sort of algorithms based on a lot of these sort of simplifying, finding patterns, that kind of stuff. Netflix recommendations algorithms, and even reducing pixels in picture compression. So when when you're trying to compress a picture down, so for size, like some very large picture, and you're trying to compress it, or video or something like that. One of the ways in which compression works is is in a similar process to this eigenvalue eigenvector decomposition. So I'm trying to explain sort of what's happening with data. I wanted to find something that was sort of analogous. I wanted to show you something that would give you an idea of what's going on with an eigenvalue, eigenvector decomposition. So what I found is a pretty good explanation. I think I got it off of uh, Quora or something like that. I found a link and the, the person explanation was pretty, pretty uh, straightforward, simple, and I liked it and it made sense to me. Hopefully it makes sense to you too. So let's say I have a photo. All right, so here's the original photo and it's it's got 400 row vectors, meaning that the picture can be, can be sliced up into 400 sort of rows of information. Think of it like a printer. If your printer was gonna print this picture out, you would likely have 400 stripes, you know, going through here to actually print out every single pixel, picture or pixel that's, that's, that's available in this particular photograph. Now I picked, I picked one that's black and white on purpose to sort of simplify things, but it's, you can think of these as sort of white and black dots. Okay, instead of numbers, they're just rows of white and black dots that when put together actually make this picture look like something that's recognizable. And it takes, in this particular case, 400 rows of black and white dot vectors. Right? Just rows of black and white dots are printed, printed them out. Okay? All right. I can do an eigenvalue, eigenvector decomposition of this picture to try to find patterns in the photograph that I can then recreate with a simplified set of information. So let's say I do that. So if I do an eigenvalue, eigenvector decomposition, the uninteresting result is that the eigenvalue, eigenvector decomposition comes back and tells me that there are 400 eigenvectors that can replace these 400 row vectors. Well, that's not interesting, right? All I'm doing is just trying to explain 400 things with 400 patterns. It doesn't really help much, right? The flip side is if I try to use too few patterns, I may not recapture enough of it. So you got to find some medium, some, ha some happy medium between extracting, every, you know, as many eigenvectors as you have original row vectors, original data, that's sort of not interesting. And then also not being able to recapture the photo. So let's say I do an eigenvalue, eigen, eigenvector decomposition, and I just retain one eigenvector. So it finds the biggest pattern. Now the biggest pattern here, if you think about just as a, as a global, it's black and white photo. So the biggest pattern is just that everything's gray. That makes sense? Just like we just combine black and white together. So we just retain one 
eigenvector. It just gives me a bunch of black and white lines that sort of make up a gray sort of grid. So if I just keep one eigenvector, this is one eigenvector. This is trying to explain all 400 eigenvectors. It doesn't do a very good job. This looks nothing like the photo. It's not really capturing anything. It's not really giving us any other patterns except there are black and white and gray in the photo. That's it. It's just saying, hey, this, this picture's got black and white and gray. Which this picture does have black and white and gray, but it doesn't look anything like this because it's not, it, it didn't retain enough information to really recapture the original photo. All right. Maybe I retain a little more. This is two eigenvectors now. Now, one thing to keep in mind is up here at the top where the window is, is a brighter, the white and, and gray and black, are, it's a brighter shade of it. It's much more white because of the, the sunlight coming in. And then down here, it's a darker sort of color. So it came back with two patterns. It's got the sort of lighter up here and the darker down here. All right, it's two eigenvectors started to cap, re, you know, capture some of the patterns in here. So it's starting it start to identify patterns, but again, they're not the patterns aren't quite clear enough to make this photo look like this photo. I haven't retained enough information, right? Yes, I've dramatically reduced the amount of, amount of information going from this photo to this one's a dramatic drop, but it doesn't even, but it doesn't quite capture the, the patterns I'm looking for. I don't, I don't see that photo in this. Let's say I go to 10 eigenvectors. So I skipped forward a little bit, I realize. But now I've gone to 10 and it's starting to identify patterns in the data by retaining only 10 eigenvectors. So we went from 400 row vectors to 10 sort of summary vectors, these, these sort of pattern vectors, eigenvectors. And uh, it's not great, right? This is 400 row vectors. It's a pretty clear photo. You get to here, the photo is not very clear, but you can start to see the photo, which is 10. 10 eigenvectors are starting to recapture these 400 row vectors. And you're starting to see the person's face, their hands. You're starting to see some of the of the pattern in the photograph pretty clear. You see, see his tie, right? So it's able to, to capture a lot of the patterns in the colors, the gray and all that stuff, using way less information. So you can sort of see if I wanted to compress this photo, if I compress it too much, it's going to actually make the photo look awful. Which if you've ever, if you've ever compressed photos or videos, that happens. If you compress them too much, they start to look like crap. So what's happening is we're trying to find the core information that's in this photo, strip out some of the, the non-necessary stuff, reduce the image size so we can actually store it easier. Okay. Sometimes you go a little too far and it can ruin the photo. Now, all right, what if I go to 50? So if I retain 50 of the original 400 rows and I, and I retain these eigenvectors, these sort of summary rows, summary vectors, I use 50 of them. I can see this actually, this photo is perfectly, it perfectly resembles this photo. Now you can tell this is a more pixely. It's not quite as clear because it's got a lot of, lot, it's got, it's got a, a lot less information in it. Right? It's got an eighth, the, the, the amount of information in it. But you can see the photo, it's pretty clear. So this is oftentimes when, when photos get compressed down to a smaller size, they're stripping out information, but it has to know how to strip it out. What things are not important? How can I can keep the patterns, but get rid of some of the information? So the picture looks a little bit worse, but you can still see the patterns and now the, the the photo has got a lot less information. We've ever, we've summarized it quite a bit with just 50 eigenvectors of the original 400 vectors or 400 rows. So again, this is not a perfect, perfect, perfect explanation, but you get to the idea that we're often we have a lot of information. We're trying to extract patterns, trying to find information, try to explain a lot of information with just a few bits of information. And that's what an eigenvalue eigenvector decomposition does. And again, if you don't take anything away from this from this talk except that, that eigenvalue eigenvector decomposition is just trying to summarize large piece of information. And we can use that to our advantage in cases like factor analysis and MANOVA and places where we're trying to summarize patterns of data together. So I, I wanted to mention I got this from using only 50 unique vectors, the picture is mostly captured. If we retain more vectors, the better the clearer the picture is going to be. All the way up to retaining 400 of them, which means I'll perfectly represent the photograph, but that I've also not saved anything. I'm not, I've not found any patterns. I've not reduced information. I just explained 400 things with 400 things, which is pretty uninteresting. So I took this from, um, you see this link. If you look up Quora, his name is Jason Liu, and he, his explanation on it is pretty good. He's one that will use this photograph. I thought it was a pretty good explanation.
And again, no, singular variety decomposition is a special case of eigenvalue decomposition where the original vectors undergo a special pretreatment. Basically, they're, 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 all, they're all set to have the same length in terms of vectors. It's called orthonormalization. And it, you just do that first before doing the eigenvalue decomposition. That's a, a singular value decomposition, but they're the same process, more or less. So hopefully th this is clear. I mean, I, th this to me was clearer than most explanations I ever got when I was first learning about this stuff. I think this is pretty good. It, may, it makes some sense of how this stuff works. Let's think about how this this works mathematically. And again, at this point, you may completely tune out, and that's okay. But again, I'm not, I'm not expecting you to be experts in, in this. I'm trying to get you an idea of how it works and what the pieces are. So eigenvalues, eigenvectors, it's, it's a way of rearranging and consolidating the information in a matrix. So if we define a matrix, this matrix is a square matrix, D, it's an M by M matrix. I, an eigenvalue decomposition is defined if I take the my matrix times a vector, which is my eigenvector, that should equal the same eigenvalue time, uh, sorry, the eigenvalue times the same vector. So notice the V vector is the same. V is an M by one, this V is an M by one, so it's the eigenvector matrix. So I'm able to then reduce this complicated matrix into two components, a value, an eigenvalue is a singular number, a number is a scalar, and a vector, okay? So I can take any matrix and try to break it down, where it's defined as, well, if I take the matrix times a vector, I should get the exact same thing by taking the eigenvalue times a vector. And if that's true, then I've, I've, I've achieved an eigenvalue decomposition. This will be perfectly true if I retain all conceivable vectors. If I don't, like with our case here, if I don't keep enough vectors, it's not going to be perfectly matched. But the more that I retrieve, the closer this will be to being true. All right, so let's look at what that means. Think of it as taking a matrix and allowing it to be represented by two parts. So instead of just being one matrix, and I was saying, hey, this, this big matrix, we, we can now represent it by just a single number, a scalar, and a vector, like a variable in, in the matrix. So just one value and a vector. Now, it's going to be a few of these. So we're going to have a few values and vectors. But the idea is that we're, we're pulling apart this large matrix into component pieces of scalar, the, the eigenvalue, and a vector, the eigenvector. Right? So the, the larger the matrix is, the more these you're going to have and the more these you're going to want to retain. But you can actually find out that be, as the, if there's patterns in the matrix, you can retain significantly less of these values and vectors than you have the total matrix and be able to recover a lot of the matrix with less information, the same way we do with that photo. Okay. So another way to look at it is like this. So if I take, I have... My eigenvalues right here times an identity matrix. If I take and subtract those, my my original matrix minus this diagonalized eigenvalue matrix, if I multiply that by my eigenvector, it should equal zero. What? So think about this. So here's my original matrix, A, B, C, D. Here's my eigenvalue. I multiply that into a identity matrix. If I subtract those, Multiply by my eigenvector, I should get zero. Okay. I can so I can I can distribute this into here, so it, so I get the eigenvalues in both places, which is right here, and then I can subtract by simply just subtracting the pieces: a minus the eigenvalue here, b minus zero, c minus zero, and the d minus this eigen the same number here. Once I do that, multiply by this vector, I get zero. Again, you need to know this. No, am I going to test you on this? No. The idea is that. I now just have two pieces of information. I have just one eigenvalue and, and a vector of numbers. And with those two things, I should be able to recapture a lot of what's going on in this D matrix. Okay. All right, I'm going to dive further into this. Just again, not so that you are somehow an expert in matrices and things. Get you an idea of sort of how this works in a sim hopefully simplified way, using the example out of Tobias and Fidel's book. So if the eigenvalues, so back, go back up a second. If I, if I have, if, if my D matrix is a two by two, this, this matrix here, the most I can actually extract two by two, I have two rows, two vector, two column vectors. The most I can give an eigenvalue and eigenvector is two, right? Because I have two vectors, e either way you look at it. 
I can only explain the, at maximum, I can only extract two vectors to explain those two vectors. Like I can't pull any more information out of it than, than two vectors worth of information because that's all that's in the original matrix. So I, so I can really do this twice potentially. I can do it once with one eigenvalue and then again with another eigenvalue. So I can get two different vectors and two different eigenvalues together to explain my original D matrix. And if the eigenvalues that I extract, those two eigenvalues, one and two, equals zero, then the previous statement is true, right? If, if I just say, look, my eigenvalue is zero, D minus zero, I just make this zero, that makes this zero, and then we subtract nothing, and then I can just have this be like one and one, then it, it's an easy solution. But I, I don't want that. I want a non a non-boring solution. So when it comes to a non-boring solution, what happens is that, that when I take my the values and subtracting the eigenvalues like this, it's the most interesting when when that when the determinant of this matrix is zero. So I can sort of solve for that because remember it's this minus I'm sorry, this times this minus this times this is how I find my determinant. So I can actually set that up. This is my diagonals minus the other diagonal equals zero. I can then spread it all apart. So I can actually then generalize it to this thing that like to X here, that I want all this to equal zero. And you can re rearrange this and apply this whole thing where it, I want my eigenvalue to equal something that satisfies this, this equation. Again, don't have to know it, not to memorize it. It's just how do we figure out what eigenvalues and vectors are the ones that we want and how they work. So if we if we if we apply this scenario where the eigenvalue is zero, then we can we can set everything up to, to equal zero and then solve for those values. What values need to be in there in order to figure it out? What values need to, to fall in there somewhere? Let's say I have a real matrix five one four two. I can figure out what the eigenvalue is supposed to be by plugging in those numbers in there and solving for the eigenvalue, which then is plugged in here, I get two separate solutions. So if I plug everything in, there's two different ways I can actually get the zero, which is um, by plugging in six for the eigenvalue or one for the eigenvalue. Okay, so once I have those two numbers, I know my eigenvalue, my first eigenvalue is six, second one is one. So if we use that first eigenvalue and plug it in, Six here, right? So five minus six is negative one. Two minus six down here is negative four. And I'll have these numbers, negative one, four, one, negative four, and, and I gotta solve for what this might be. So I can do take negative one times V1 plus one times V2 equals to zero. Actually, well, the, the, it's part of it. Then four times V1 plus negative four or minus four times V2, and putting this, these two together. And if we solve for this, I'm gonna, again, I'm trying to go through this quickly. If we solve for this, I can actually figure out that the two values should be one and one. So if you plug in one and one here, negative one times one and one times one, that's zero. Negative four times, four times one plus negative four times one is also zero. So if I plug in my eigenvector is one and one, then this whole thing becomes true, okay? Let me so far. So if I plug in one and one for these values, I'm trying to solve for V1, negative one times one plus one times negative one gives me zero. Four times one is four minus four times one is four. So four, times four minus four is also zero. Zero plus zero is zero. Then this eigenvector makes this eigenvalue of six true when it gets plugged back into the original equation. What about the second one? We'll do the same kind of thing. Well, the second eigenvalue was one. So five minus one is four. Two minus one is one. So I have four, four, one, one. So four times V1, one times V2 right here. And then four times V1, one times V2. All right, well, if I if in the first one equals zero, four times negative one plus one times four give me zero. Four times negative one plus one times four equals zero. If they give me the same one twice, these two work perfectly fine. Four times negative one plus one times four 
gives me negative 4 plus 4 is 0. 4 times negative 1 plus 1 times 4 is negative 4 plus 4 equals 0. So this eigenvector corresponds nicely to this eigenvalue of 1 that we found before. And we can then test it. Let's see, you know, show that the original equation holds. Well, I can plug in my values here. So remember, it's my original matrix times a vector equals my eigenvalue times the same vector. So if I take this, it's 5 times 1 plus 1 times 1. So 5 plus 1 equals 6. 4 times 1 plus 2 times 1 is 4 plus 2 also equals 6. So that's so that's the that's what d times v equals is 6 over 6. And if I just take my value of the eigenvalue of 6 times my vector, I also get 6 over 6. So that this is true for the first eigenvalue. The matrix times the eigenvector gives me 6 over 6. And so does taking 6 times my vector of 1 over 1. It also gives me 6 over 6. So this holds for the first eigenvalue. What about the second one? The second eigenvalue is 1, and the vector is negative 1 over 4. So 5 times negative 1 plus 1 times 4 is negative 5 plus 4 is negative 1. 4 times negative 1 is negative 4 plus 2 times 4 is 8, so negative 4 plus 8 is going to be 4. Negative 1 over 4 is, the, is when, I, when I take my matrix times my eigenvector, I get my result is negative 1 over 4. If I take my eigenvalue of 1 and multiply it by negative 1 over 4, I also get negative 1 over 4. So again, this holds. So you're probably thinking, again, as you're going through all this stuff, I don't care. Why do I care about any of this stuff? We just took a matrix and broke it down into one vector and a number. And by using that vector and that number, I'm able to reproduce the, the same resulting matrix that I get from using my entire matrix. I can actually re reproduce a portion of my matrix by just using a single number and a vector. So I'm able to recapture it. Now, I may not be able to do that with just one of them. I may have to sort of you know, add across multiples of these, but I'm able to reproduce, so that's the, the sort of takeaway here, is I'm able to take something that's complicated, break it down into a single unit and a, and, and a corresponding vector to be, to be able to recapture patterns within it that I can then break down and use and to simplify very complex matrices by patterns within it. So this small matrix, I know, I realize it, this is a, this, in this example, it's a very small matrix. It doesn't need to be reduced. You know, it's already pretty small. But imagine this is much larger we can take a matrix like this, it can be broken down into two, instead of having one two-dimensional matrix, I can have two single-dimension vectors that can actually recapture a, the, the matrix. So you have the two vectors along with corresponding values that actually end up giving us pretty useful information about how well these vectors are actually explaining this data we'll, we'll come back to later. So we can actually take something like, we can also think about it as D can be broken down into two other matrices. One matrix that has the eigenvalues, called the L matrix here, actually the lambda matrix, but it's L. So six over one, like this, right, is the diagonal. And then I have the two vectors, my first vector and my second vector. They all correspond. And I can take my vector times my, my lambda times my vector transposed and completely recapture that matrix. So using this lambda matrix and this vector matrix, right, the eigenvector matrix, I can combine these two together and completely recapture D. As long as I retain all the vectors, D can be completely recaptured. So, you know, again, I can multiply them across and actually get back to my original matrix. Which is great. And, you know, th this actually approximates D. So if I, if I retain all the vectors, then I can completely recapture D completely. Their values will be exactly 100% the same. It's like in that photo, if I use 400 vectors to explain 400 rows, well, yeah, they're going to be exactly the same. But when I use 50 vectors to explain the 400 rows, it approximated the original. So I can use V, V, L, V, inverse this 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 can actually reproduce d and i can even 
keep less than the maximum number of vectors and oftentimes still do a pretty good job of recapturing the original matrix as long as I keep enough of them. So that's the trick is how many do I need to retain to really capture the original matrix and how much is sort of garbage that can be thrown out. It's just noise and, and it's not giving us any information about the patterns within the data. So that's a big part of what we're trying to do is what are the patterns? What's the noise? Can we separate out stuff that actually goes together and separate those from other things that go together and separate all that from things that are just noise and, and don't really help us identify patterns at all? So it's a bit of the, the art of, of doing things like factor analysis and stuff where you're trying to figure out how many of these vectors do I really need to retain to, to really do a good job reproducing the matrix. All right. So again, nutshell, that stuff, eigenvalue, eigenvector decomposition. It takes a bunch of data. It starts to separate out into patterns. Here are some vectors, and those vectors can hopefully are, are explaining patterns or finding patterns going through large clusters of data. And each of those has a corresponding eigenvalue that can actually tell us a bit about the quality. How well is that vector actually doing at explaining those patterns? And we'll talk about that later on. Come back to even just in the next in the next bit, which is a canonical correlation, we can talk a little bit about how to judge that. But it's also why in the data screening with the condition index, why looking at because each each vector, eigenvector that gets put through space captures the largest amount of of, of the biggest amount of pattern. So it's it's it's, it's capturing the biggest amount of information it can. So the first eigenvalue that gets put out there is going to be big. It's going to be it's going to have the largest eigenvalue that corresponds to it. Each one after that, the eigenvalue is going to get smaller and smaller. So as you take the ratio of the first to to you know consecutive eigenvalues after that, you're going to start to see it cycle down. As you get down to the bottom, the bottom are going to be really small. The first eigenvalue is going to be really large. If that ratio is like 30 or more, which is what it was in the condition index. That means there's a presence of, of a very large multicollinear pattern in your data when you don't want it. With factor analysis, you actually want data to be collinear. You want there to be some relationships. With something like regression, you don't. So applying this to different places can be positive or negative. So we're going to come back to talk about that more when we get to canonical correlation, talk about MANOVA, when we talk about factor analysis. We're going to be revisiting this idea of using this eigenvalue or singular value decomposition to find patterns and use that to our advantage to then to then combine data together all right so let's uh, leave the more matrices lecture and we'll, and we'll move right on to canonical correlation